Last year I learned something at my father's funeral that confirmed his status in my mind as a game changer. You see, in 1961, he bought a Shell gas station in Iowa, Louisiana. It's a, it's a small, small little town that's sort of what I describe as a bump on the side of the bayou. And when he bought that gas station, he bought everything that went with it. He bought the, the, the tires stacked up on the rack. He bought cases and cases of all. He bought fuel reserves maxed out to capacity and an unexpected surprise, a gift. It was Houston Victorian. See, Houston was a, what they referred to in 1961 as a colored man. See, that was before desegregation had really felt its full impact. Houston had worked with the previous owner for over 20 years, but when Dad bought the gas station, he made the decision to go with him. One night, about 11 o'clock, just before closing, a car pulled up to get filled up, filled up. Houston and Dad went to service the car. And after filling up the car, the window rolled down and the driver slipped a $5 bill out of the window to Houston. Houston took the money and handed it to my dad and my dad said, go put it in the cash register. And Houston was shocked. He looked up at him and said, Mr. J Mr. Joe, I, I can't do that. Dad said, why not? He said, I'm, I'm not allowed to touch the box. Remember those old time cash registers? You know, the one you hit the big button and the drawer would bing and pop open. Dad looked at Houston and said, go put the money in the box. Houston turned around and shuffled into the office and dad walked around the corner of the building to watch. And there was Houston standing at that cash register with a hand shaking. And he hit the button, box pops open, and he slipped the money inside and he shut it. And for the first time in 20 years, he had been trusted. See, my dad was a game changer for Houston. And you'll find out because of my dad's presence in Houston life, he became a game changer for me. See, that's what we're called upon to do. We're called upon on this face of the earth as we walk in our life to change the games of the people that we come into contact with. And I'm going to share a couple of principles today with you, about five different principles that really help us to understand how do you do that? How do you be that game changer? You know, the first one is worth about a penny. It really is. It's about a penny. Okay? Now, I'm looking around the room here, and I see a few people in here that, that look like you might have a little bit of technical competence in your background. When you look at a penny, what's a penny made out of? Copper, right? Now, I ask a group of high school kids, you know what they said? The little kid in the front row goes, copper and zinc. I'm going, oh, shut up. Okay? It's <laughs> copper. Copper. Now, this... This is a magnet, all right? This is a magnet. Now, if I take copper and I put a magnet up against it, what happens? Not much, right? Okay. How in the world is this happening? Well, no magic. 1945, World War II, the war machine that we were building to win the war had sucked all of copper out of the U.S. industries. Pennies that year were made out of steel. See, what I did is I covered these pennies with copper. Put a little shiny covering on the outside. See, that's what we do in our life. See, each and every one of us, each and every one of you in this room right now, have this wonderful, magnificent steel that sits inside of you. But you know what we do? To cope with the busyness of life, we wrap ourselves, sometimes with shiny copper, that does not allow people to see the true essence of our soul. And it's only when we become vulnerable and let people look inside of us do they really see the strength of our character. Third point that I want to make that has to do with how we become game changers comes from Pat Riley, you know, the president and chairman of the Miami Heat. Uh, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird 
were playing basketball in college, and they were fierce rivals. And their rivalry extended into the NBA. Magic Johnson ends up with the LA Lakers. Uh, Larry Bird ends up with the Bo uh, Boston Celtics. And they are going at each other tooth and nail. And unfortunately, Larry Bird and the Celtics are kicking the Laker Lakers stuff. Uh, the second year that Pat Riley was head coach, he walked in one day. And he walked in with a flip chart. And on the side of the, uh, the, the flip chart were Magic Johnson and the rest of the Lakers statistics. All of the statistics, the, the statistics they had from the previous game. Now, on the other side of the flip chart, rather than having the opponent's scores, the opponent's points, the opponent's assists, on the other side of the flip chart were Magic Johnson's career best efforts. What they refer to as CBE. His best effort he ever had in assists. So it really didn't matter what took place in that last game. Instead of competing against the competition against Larry Bird, uh, Pat Riley pointed him back to himself and said, what was the best that you ever did? What was your career best effort? And are you willing to measure yourself against that? And for some reason, magically, the Lakers' performance rose to epic proportion because they stopped competing against the other guys and they started competing against themselves, their own CB. How many times in your work do you think of the person down the hall, in the other cubicle, down the street, somebody on television that you compare yourself to, trying to determine your sense of worth instead of looking in the mirror of life saying, am I doing the very best that I can? Am I putting forth my CBE? See, my dad, my dad believed in CBE. He really did. Late in life, just before he was 80 years old, he was in his second career. He was, he was still working, you know. He was. He was working as a security guard at Kroger grocery store. He was. And he believed in CBE. And uh, so much so that he was still chasing shoplifters. <laughs> he, he was. He was. Matter of fact, matter of fact, there was a guy, there was a young 20-something-year-old guy who comes in one night. And he goes to the meat counter, and he walks over, and Dad kind of catches him out of the corner of his eye. Because the guy's over at the meat counter doing some kind of surveillance. And he looks down, think nobody's looking, and he reaches down and grabs some spare ribs. Just like we all do when we go shopping, right? Except what he does, instead of putting them in his shopping cart, he sticks them down his pants. Now, he starts sauntering toward the door with the spare ribs down his pants, and Dad's watching him. Dad sneaks around the other aisle to head him off and hits him the door just about the time the guy's making an exit. Now, the guy turns and sees Dad, and he sees an 80-year-old security guard, and he has a decision to make. I am 20-something with spare ribs in my pants. I have an 80-year-old security guard that I may be able to outrun. I'm heading for it. And he does. He's running, and my dad chased him for a half a mile. Now, the question that I have is, this guy's got spare ribs down his pants. Can you imagine him walking into a barbecue going, hey, I hope y'all are hungry. I brought the ribs. <laughs> a half a mile later, the guy finally looks up and sees my dad. Is still, can, you imagine this, can you imagine this race? The guy with the ribs going down the street half a mile, and my dad, 80 years old, chasing him. <laughs> After a half a mile, he gives up. He finally decides that nobody in their right mind are going to eat these ribs. <laughs> and he looks up at my dad, pulls the ribs out of his pants, and looks at him dead in the eye and goes, Who are you? <laughs> and my dad walks over to him, grabs the ribs, and in the best impression of Clint Eastwood goes, not on my watch. <laughs> not on my watch. When was the last time you had a project that you were running into a problem? You had a client that you were in a situation that you just couldn't, it was one of those clients that we have that you just, you just can't seem to satisfy. 
you've got an issue you're trying to wrestle, or maybe even more importantly at home, there's something that's going on at home that you're really to kind of back up, but do you stop and you go, not on my watch? Do you bring CBE? Or better yet, do you leave CBE at work? Do you leave CBE at your desk? It's the end of the day and you're driving back home. You walk into the door and you're tired and you're frustrated. You may be angry at something that took place. Your spouse is there, your children is there, the dog is there. Have you left your CBE at, ho at the office? My wife is a migraine, was a migraine sufferer. And uh, for many nights, she'd wake up about 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, head pounding. One night she woke me up because she was having a hard time taking it. I got up as I usually did and kind of stumbled into the kitchen and got the bags of ice and went back to the be bedroom and packed her head in ice and, and started massaging her head. And after about five minutes, I hear this little voice going, now that's CBE. It was a gift she gave to me for me to stop, to be in the moment, to be in every moment and making sure that I'm looking in the mirror trying to evaluate with what I bring today with right now as I'm interacting with a client, when I'm interacting with my boss, when I'm interacting with those people who are choosing to follow me, when I'm dealing with my daughter Nikki, with my wife Tommy, and even with my dog, am I stopping to make sure that this moment, this time, they've got the best of what I've got to offer, that I bring the best today to them because when I do, I become a game changer for him. See, next to the Shell gas station was Brownie's Cafe. It's your typical little small town diner. It was right across the parking lot. And every day, for over 20 years, Houston would see that diner. Sometimes he would walk past this big plate glass window and kind of look inside out of the corner of his eye. Because for the 20 years he was there, no African-American had walked in those doors and had sat down deep. But one sunny afternoon, he strode across that parking lot, walked in, opened the door, and sat down at the counter and had a meal. He became a game changer because he changed his life, and the way he did it was the first thing he had to do was he had to forget about all the unfairness that he, ever, he had ever experienced, all of the unfair situations, circumstances, and the way he had been treated, the cards that he had been dealt. He had to leave that behind and look toward the future. And when he did, he changed his life. He changed the life of that town in his own small way, it changed society. We get an opportunity every day to ask the question, do I want to be a game changer? The question becomes, am I willing to step into that gap, into that space where I'm uncomfortable? Because that's where our dreams live. But when you do, you will change the lives of not only yourself, but anybody and everybody you come into contact with. Thank you very much.